Is it time? It is time for us to do what we have been doing, and that time is every day. We'll know in a very short period of time, but it looks like it could be something that will be uh, not good. Believe me, not good. Um, so, uh, you know, I see issue with yeah, that. And okay, again, yeah, you're, yeah, hey, yeah, hey, yeah, hey, 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 uh, you're not going to be able to insult your way to the presidency. That's not going to happen. I don't know who created Pokemon Go, but I'm trying to figure out how we get them to have Pokemon go to the polls. I'm Ted Cruz, and my pronoun is kiss my ass. So when you think about it, there is great significance to the passage of time in terms of what we need to do to lay hey, these hey, lines, hey. what we need to do <laughs> to create these will jobs. Not get you. America is a nation that can be defined in a single word. I was going to foot him in uh, foot, foot. Not good. Believe me, not good. Hello, dissidents. Welcome, one and all, to a Tuesday evening edition of the Do Dissidents podcast. My name is Keaton Weiss here, of course, with Russell Dobular. Hola! All righty, we are going to start out with a sound drop because we are at 672 in the Rumble chat. That's right. The Rumble house is fuller than the YouTube house so far. 523 strong in the YouTube chat. That ain't bad. 672 over on Rumble. Everybody's filing in for the white rural rage podcast that's what we should call this from now on maybe we should change that i don't know has a nice ring to it although neither of us are particularly rural uh or particularly white yeah that's right (laughs) yeah yeah. (laughs) i mean it depends it depends who you're talking to you know i'm I'm gonna be we're gonna be doing a segment on this full court press they're doing to define anti-zionism as anti-semitism uh, they're getting really cute with that. But, uh, you know, they keep hitting the point that anti-Semitism is symptomatic of populism, meaning, you know, lower class people. You know, um, Ivy League schools actually developed admission criterion to keep Jews out. The admission process, that that was actually created to screen out Jews. It used to just be you were a rich wasp. They let you in. They, did, right. they, didn't, they didn't have an application process. They developed that so they could be like, so where are you from? Right. Odessa. Oh, I see. It's uh, out. Um, they had that at some schools until the 60s. So what is, is that populism? What about country clubs? You have some country clubs to this day don't let Jews in. That's true. That's true. So I guess. Uh, so are we white? I don't know. Not according to them. We'll have to ask Time Magazine. We'll have to submit that we'll letter have to, to we'll the have editor. To ask Time. Letter to the editor. Exactly. Well, or well, no. We'll have to write a letter to some of the country clubs in South Florida. That, yeah, and that see, right? Yeah, members. exactly. Right. Um, folks, um, like I mentioned on Sunday, uh, this is uh, a history-making week for our project here. This is the first four-show week. Uh, of our new schedule and so tomorrow that's wednesday march 6th at 2 p.m for those who are watching this on the replay for those who watch this tomorrow morning um wednesday march 6th that's tomorrow at 2 p.m eastern we are doing our bonus show our fourth weekly stream that is going to be with our friend anish shivani that will be exclusively on Rumble. So it is very important that you join our Substack. You can join for free. That's a newsletter, dodissidents.substack.com. It's also very important that you go to rumble.com front slash dodissidents. If you're here watching on YouTube now, that's wonderful. We love YouTube as well. But tomorrow's show is a Rumble exclusive. Some of these Wednesday shows are going to be Rumble exclusives, and we thought we would kick things off by making our first fourth stream of the week a Rumble exclusive. It's going to be a banger. We have our friend Anish Shivani, who's going to talk about two articles, one that he wrote uh, on October 31st, 2020, in which he predicted that Donald Trump would, in retrospect, appear the lesser evil to Joe Biden, and he spelled out exactly why. And a lot of what he 
predicted in that article proved to be uncannily accurate. So that's going to be wild looking back at that. And we're also going to look at uh, some new pieces of his because he just launched his Substack, And so that's going to be a lot of fun. We also have uh, some great segments planned tomorrow. We're going to be looking into RFK Jr.'s rap release. That'll be fun. Uh, we have a full piece that Russell is putting together on these sort of new anti-Semitism articles that are coming out, uh, so to speak. And then protesters relentlessly interrupted a Kirsten Gillibrand event. We'll be covering that tomorrow and possibly whatever breaks between now and then. So that's going to be a lot of fun. That's going to be tomorrow at 2 p.m. exclusively on Rumble. We're not doing a switch. We're not starting here and switching there. It is going to be only on Rumble. It's going to be a lot of fun. And so uh, please go and sign up to our channel over there and meet us there at 2 p.m., that is going to be a great one. And now we're at 743 strong in the YouTube chat. There we go. Hail we him. Go. All Indeed. hail him. Exactly. Um, all righty, everybody. So we do have some news to break this evening. This broke yesterday, uh, but huge news, no doubts. The Supreme Court rules states can't like I said, kick hail Trump him. off the ballot. Yeah, right. Hail, hail him. him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The Supreme Court rules states cannot kick Donald Trump off of the ballot. NBC News, this broke, like I said, of course, yesterday. The Supreme Court on Monday handed a sweeping win to former President Donald Trump by ruling that states cannot kick him off the ballot over his actions leading up to the January 6th attack on the Capitol bringing a swift end to a case with huge implications for the 2024 election. In an unsigned ruling with no dissents, nine to nothing, the court reversed the Colorado Supreme Court, which had determined that Trump could not serve again as president under Section 3 of the Constitution's 14th Amendment. The provision prohibits those who previously held government positions but later, quote, engaged in insurrection from running for various offices. The court said the Colorado Supreme Court had wrongly assumed that states can determine whether a presidential candidate or other candidate for federal office is ineligible. The ruling makes it clear that Congress, not states, has to set rules on how the 14th Amendment provision can be enforced against federal office seekers. As such, the decision applies to all states, not just Colorado. States retain the power to bar people for running for state office from appearing on the ballot under Section 3. Because the Constitution makes Congress, rather than the states, responsible for enforcing Section 3 against all federal office holders and candidates, we reverse, the ruling said. So they can kick someone off of their state ballot, but they can't kick someone off a federal ballot. Right. Makes perfect right. sense. Most people saw this coming a mile away. Uh, but not most in the mainstream media, as we will get to in just a second. By deciding the case on that legal question, the court avoided any analysis or determination of whether Trump's actions constituted an insurrection. The decision comes just the day before the Colorado primary, which is happening right now, as are all of these Super Tuesday primaries. Minutes after the ruling, Trump hailed the... Uh, decision in an all capital letters post on his social media site writing big win for america big win <laughs> for america in addition to ensuring that trump remains on the ballot in colorado this is the big part here this was a minor question although russ and i called this pretty much accurately the decision will end similar cases that have arisen so he got taken off of the illinois ballot a few days ago and we said that's not going to stand for much longer because the court's about to rule here, and here uh -huh. we have it. Yeah. So far, only two other states, Maine and Illinois, followed Colorado's paths. Like the Colorado ruling, both of those decisions were put on hold. Now, although the bottom line vote was unanimous, there were some divisions on the court. This is what the liberals are trying to spin, that this was a more divided ruling than yeah, it was, yeah. which has a six to three conservative majority as to how the case was resolved. So the three liberal justices, Sonia Ma Sotomayor, Elena Kagan, and Ketanji Brown Jackson, complained in a jointly written concurring opinion. Concurring, the, I think, is the key word there. Right. Yeah. Concurring opinion, not dissenting opinion. Concurring right. opinion. Right. It was a concurring opinion overall, 
but they nitpicked, they pointed out that in their mind, the court had decided more than it needed to by laying out how Section 3 can be enforced by Congress. So their complaint was not that the ruling was wrong, just that it's broader and went further than it should have gone in its scope. It's like saying, look, we agreed to suck you off, but you know, you kind of came in our mouths without warning us first, right? That was basically what Well, they that said. well in that fact, was that's what uh, was in the writing. Well, that's well, what no, 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 that's wrote. Not... That was her first draft and they said, you know, maybe we should put this a little bit more tactfully. You know, I don't mean to be vulgar. That's just the best way I no, know how to well, explain. Well, well, Keaton, you really have to do better research before you go on. That was <laughs> that was actually Amy Coney Barrett's uh, footnote. Yeah. to the uh <laughs> yeah, to the right. descent <laughs> yeah i mean that's that's my that's the best metaphor i have for it that you know look yeah. i'm a simple man i didn't finish i didn't finish college i'm not a lawyer okay i don't know how else to put it that's a that's they, i think a they, good they, metaphor. they felt that the court didn't need to swallow right exactly exactly right you you you, you could have either spit or you know done right. something you right. know we, we won't get into there this is a very highbrow podcast we won't get into all the alternatives, right? But we'll just, you know, leave that there. Like I said, this is a family show. Uh, they said the decision could insulate Trump from further controversy, adding that the ruling shuts the door on other potential means of federal enforcement of Section 3. Conservative Justice Amy Coney Barrett agreed that the court went further than required, although she did not join the liberal justice's opinion. Okay, so there is no real dissent. Some of the libs are saying this was 5-4. Some are saying it was 6-3 because Barrett kind of agreed with them but kind of didn't. Bottom line is, as Amy Pancakes points out here, Barrett said that although she had some disagreements with the rationale, the liberals should not amplify disagreement in such a politically charged case. All nine justices agree on the outcome of this case. That is the message Americans should take home. And she got criticized for saying that because how dare you minimize the dissent? There was no dissent. Even NBC, as Russell mentioned, pointed out, it was a jointly written concurring opinion. So whatever disputes that some of the liberals are trying to highlight here are very minor. The fact is that the Democrats, for all of really. their fretting, right, exactly, technical, for all of their fretting about what a threat to democracy Donald Trump is, it was now found unanimously by the Supreme Court, including among three pretty die-in-the-wool liberals, that... The Democrats illegally tried to remove Donald Trump from the race by taking him off of state ballots one by one by one. And I know you're going to hear the Colorado Secretary of State say, well, this was actually Republican voters and unaffiliated voters who brought the lawsuit. We just backed it. Yeah. And a Democrat appointed court ruled. I'm sure they found some Lincoln Project types right, who were going to put this up because they didn't want a disqualified candidate representing them in November, right, mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. some fretting Ukraine mm -hmm. flag-waving Bill Crystal types, right, and that's what they mm -hmm. like to point to. Republicans brought the lawsuit. That's nonsense. A Democrat-appointed judge uh, brought this forward, and this was now rejected by a 6-3 conservative majority with all three liberal justices saying, of course, this cannot happen. And when we were on the Jimmy Dore show uh, just last week, I said the Supreme Court, as corrupt as that institution has become, just like all of our institutions, they are the ones that show the most regard for their role within this constitutional system to the point where even Katanji Brown Jackson, a Biden appointee, says we can't go here. It's terrible right. for the country right. to go here. Right. Going here will do so much more damage to our democracy than a, even a Trump victory. Well, of course. Every election course. would be state by state trying to disqualify people from the ballot. It, yeah. it, it would just well, that, be com it, it would be complete chaos. And it's funny that Plus this the ruling comes— The short-term civil unrest would well, just be, cause irreparable harm as well, Right. aside from the precedent. This coming the same exact week— and I, I just don't know if my sanity could handle reading that fucking book. But there's the same book. There's the same week they dropped this book about how white rural voters are, among other things, the most hostile to democracy. And here you see the same exact people who are lapping that up, doing everything they can to avoid a democratic election. They, they've right. been... 
doing that with Trump all along throughout his entire political career. They have tried to circumvent the democratic process and find a way to delegitimize him, to knock him out. Their underlying assumption, it underlies everything they say about this. The voters can't be trusted. Now, okay, if that is your fundamental belief, and it clearly is, it it is the unspoken part of their entire worldview. Well, you do not believe in democracy. You believe in oligarchy. You believe in a kind of kind of uh, show elections between two people that your class finds acceptable. That's not a democracy. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and this is what is so disempowering about the resistance movement. This is why. Even after Trump won, I was never a Trump supporter. I did not vote for Donald Trump in 2016. I didn't think it was a great thing for the world that he won the election. I thought it was less harmful than had it gone the other way. I'll admit that um, for sure. Uh, But I was far from a supporter of his. And because I was not a supporter of his, I was curious, though never hopeful, uh, I must say, um, that there would be an organized resistance that was substantive in nature. And it became very obvious from literally day one with the Women's March and the President's Day bullshit march that they had, you know, a month after, um, that this was going to be controlled opposition, which is what it was, because the well, resistance the, the, the to the Donald Trump the- was so disempowering to ordinary people because it's not actually built in mass movements or mass politics or mass consciousness. It's actually premised in the exact opposite orientation, which is appeal to the permanent power state to right. crack down on Donald right. Trump, which takes all the power away from ordinary people. It doesn't give power to ordinary people. They are now the call the manager party. In other words, our resistance against Trump is not organizing against him and mobilizing to actually, oh, I don't know, win an election. It's to blow the whistle as loud as we can, as often as we can, in the hopes that someone with permanent deep state power will come and take care of the problem for us. That's not democracy. Right. That's not even politics. That's just appealing to a shadow state to do your bidding for you. That is anti-democratic, if, if, if anything is. The Women's March was really remarkable, and it really demonstrated what the institutional left has become, a just absolute fucking hollow, devoid of content, pathetic joke. They they had no demands. They had no uh, platform. They, they marched seemingly with the premise, we're really mad that Donald Trump won the election and we're going to make hats. <laughs> right. Yeah, right. Exactly. What the fuck is that? What is that? They had literally no list of demands. They just marched. It was just an enormous uh, call the manager march. That's what they should have called it, the call the manager march. Well, all of them. All of them were like that. All of them. The tax all of them. march. The but tax that march was, was not about taxing because the rich. It was about it, somebody bust Donald Trump for not paying taxes, right? right he didn't right. pay his taxes. Right. But you really, I think, I mean, it was already pretty clear, but the women's march the Mick resistance elaborated on that theme as the Trump years went on, but the women's March really was quite incredible. I, I, I think it was really, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think I am. It was the first March of that size of that scale that was about absolutely nothing. It was the Seinfeld show of marches. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, it was Indeed. a march about nothing. There was there was nothing, and everyone was so fucking proud. I'm sure you like myself. I'm sure a lot of our audience have some lib friends who very proudly, uh, you know, posted pictures of themselves with their with their pussy hats on. And so, what point are you making? Well, it was also a way of coping with the fact that Hillary lost. They were very excited to get the first woman president, and they didn't get it. So it was like a show of support. For her, in retrospect, kind of that—that's what it was, and and they were massive. I mean, they were absolutely huge. But yeah, no demands. Usually, when you march, you no. demand something, right? No, yeah. no, no platform, no nothing, exactly. Nothing. And that that has just continued. That's just continued. I mean, you want to look at a hollow 
political movement. Look at the pathetic souls trying to make a case for Joe Biden now that they believe wrongly. We, I think we're on the same page about this wrongly that they're stuck with him. I think we're right. on the same page that in the end, that's not the person they're going to no, be voting for. No, I don't think they're stuck but with they at all. think they are. So, hey, they're going to run with it. Look, as as we speak, the votes are being counted on Super Tuesday between. I mean, you got California and Texas both voting tonight. Biden's going to get, I think, all of the delegates from both of those states. Those alone should put him pretty close to the 50 percent threshold, plus all the other states. I'd be surprised if he didn't cross 50 percent technically tonight. Once he crosses 50 at that point, the voters are out of the picture. At that point, those delegates who go to the convention in Chicago can be instructed by Jamie Harrison to vote for whoever Jamie Harrison wants them to vote for. Now, they don't technically right. have to, but come on. These are Biden right. delegates. Right. They're, right. they're right. team players, if ever there were. Right. They will vote right. for whoever they tell them to. So at this right. point, it's just up to the DNC whether they want to keep Biden on. They can force him out if they want to. They can mm -hmm. force him out if they want to. And I sure. have a feeling, a very strong feeling, that they will. But let's go on to some media reactions here because – as we all know, folks, the Supreme Court ruled 9 nothing to overturn the Colorado Supreme Court ruling, removing him from the ballot. So Trump is now back on the ballot, not just in the state of Colorado, but all over the country on November 5th, 2024. Terrifying, terrifying stuff if you're a CNN or an MSNBC viewer. Newsbusters put together a little montage of responses, and then we're going to watch a few more. Uh, but let's start here with just uh, an overall sampling. And it was a nine to nothing decision ruling that Donald Trump can be on the ballot in Colorado and other states. I'm not confident that that will produce a result that's good for American democracy. This is actually what I had been concerned about. I had been concerned that it should it go to the Supreme Court, they would rule this way. I'd laugh if it weren't so sad. My next guest says Donald Trump is still an oath-breaking insurrectionist. Do you have confidence in the Supreme Court? Do you think this court is partisan? The court itself may have overstepped. The court went way further than it needed to go. Our colleague Melissa Murray has called this Supreme Court the YOLO court. The criticism of the court is that they're playing interference. Not since Bush v. Gore have we seen a court that's had this many opportunities to interfere in the election. The headline here is this, that this is a unanimous ruling, but if you scratch the surface just a little. This is a five to four ruling on part of it. This is actually a five to four decision. It's five to four. Trump will take this. It's not five to four. For those who are watching, this is a separate clip on YouTube. We broke this down in the last segment. The, the court ruled nine nothing that he should be back on the ballot uh in november there were technical disputes as to how broad the ruling was but it is not five four it's nine zero yeah that that's just amazing that's how they hypnotize people yeah <laughs> they they just they'll just grab like you could see the development and then finally they figured out where to go with it because right. there were some minor technical disagreements oh uh, you know really uh it's actually not unanimous well because they have to make it look like it was split along party lines right. and that the right. liberals voted correctly and it's those then, republicans then and how, those how, do you, how do you explain amy pancakes that's true. you know it's just it's just they they know their fucking audience is is between 72 and dead <laughs> and uh, it doesn't really matter what they tell them between dialysis treatments they'll swallow it exactly this spin it spread the misinformation disinformation on it so it's a win for them he, he's on the ballot and voters will vote and he and he looks like he's headed to become the republican nominee for president you can't save a people from themselves if they're determined to re-elect him after he organized that insurrection then there's nothing to stop the people from doing that oh that that was larry sabato credit to newsbusters that's larry sabato there on the bottom i thought that was mike lindell for a second i thought that was my pillow guy i'm like did they have a falling out is it did he turn on him <laughs> hey i bought his pillow turns out it's a piece of shit thing as hard as a rock can't sleep i thought maybe he can't turned sleep, no, he looks like I, I, I can't even turn okay. my neck i can't even <laughs> turn my neck I can't even turn my neck on this fucking thing <laughs> it's bullshit uh no that's okay so that's that's larry sabato so apparently mike lindell has not turned on donald trump they look similar um let's go uh now to some more video this was the really the first clip to go viral 
Um, this was from CNN. Here is Dana Bash mourning the news. For America, um, you know, look, unfortunately for America, the court ne isn't necessarily wrong that this is the way the framers wanted it to be. They Time out. Unfortunately for what America? Because in the America I live in, which is here on planet Earth, um, <laughs> Donald Trump is leading in every national poll. So for what America is this unfortunate? Because in America, it seems like, according to now all of the recent polling, more Americans want Trump to be the president come January 2025 than Joe Biden. So in what universe is this unfortunate for America? It's unfortunate for the CNN well, this viewers. Is, well, the, this is why I keep saying this is the battle of our time. For a very long time, these people have been able to circumscribe the voters' choices and keep it between one establishment goon and another. Heads I win, tails you lose. It didn't matter for them who won. As much as they might have made fun of George Bush, they were perfectly happy to have George Bush and Dick Cheney. They were members of the club. Trump is something of a completely different character. And we were seeing the same thing in England with little Rishi Sunak's speech. They're freaking out exactly. because George Galloway won. This is something that's happening all around the world right now. This is an elite class that really from the 80s on didn't have to worry much about popular movements. Popular movements really had been completely defanged after the 60s and 70s. And uh, they just had their way. They had total control of the narrative. They had total control of the candidacies. And um, they're, they've, they've had that control for over 40 years. They've grown comfortable in their power. And the idea of the popular will upsetting the apple cart, this is just absolutely anathema to them. Yeah, yeah. And the media, obviously, as the propaganda arm for the people you're talking about, um, they never really cared much. They had their preferences, but more than anything, they wanted a horse race. I'll never forget in 2012, right. yep. Obama was running away with it. And then the first debate, Obama was horrible. Romney did very well. CNN was ecstatic that Romney did well because their ratings were down because Obama was way up. And mm -hmm. I remember the old guy, forget his name, he's not with them anymore. Um, he said, we've got a horse race here. They were so excited that Romney did well because now they had a race. They had ratings. Yeah, they liked Obama right. better. But if Romney wins, who cares? But point is, we want it close. We want people watching. Now you actually see how they react when they have an interest, when they actually really need one candidate to win over the other. And you didn't see this level of panic in 2016 because they did Think they didn't think it years, could happen. They'd actually lose. Exactly. No, no. You saw you saw a lot of uh, a lot of mockery. Right. <laughs> Look, they nominated Trump. No, right, Hillary's exactly. going to win Texas. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. That's what you saw back then. You didn't see uh, this. Yeah. No. The that that's what it's all about. And you you all uh, also remember that back when you still had some semblance of democracy and some possibility of candidates winning the election that were not approved of by elite um, establishment figures, uh, including in the media, they weren't as fucking rich as they are now. Right. Like the, these people are fucking sultans and pashas. They are used to now sucking up all the wealth of society and truly living as aristocrats. Well, we increasingly become a society of techno serfs. Um, exactly. Any kind of threat is much more of a threat to their position now than it was 60 years ago when you were paying a 90% tax rate. And yes, I know they got around it somewhat, but not like now where they're paying zero taxes very often you didn't you didn't have that yeah maybe they were with tax dodges they were paying 65 percent, but they weren't paying no zero percent so a threat to their interests was not the threat it is now a threat to their interests now is you're talking about a complete reordering of society right that's true they have a lot more to lose now because of where they are all right well yes. let's just keep going
they wanted Congress, the people who are closest to their constituents, to be able to make the, the rules of the laws. That doesn't change the fact that because of gerrymandering in the House and all kinds of other issues, um, they're not doing their job on a lot of these big issues. Yeah. I agree it's very unlikely, close to impossible that yeah. Congress will take action. But this is now a fair question that Manu Raju, Mel Melanie Zanona should be asking members of Congress. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to pass legislation that would give us rules for how this works? It could only be in the future, by the way. Okay, so it's it's not a fair question. It's a complete waste of time. You're going to have to do this the old-fashioned way by winning the election, right? The way you used to win power. Here's Colorado Secretary of State Jenna Griswold. Kind of an embarrassing development for her. Uh, let's hear from her. My larger reaction is disappointment. I do believe that states should be able under our Constitution to bar oath-breaking insurrectionists. Well, obviously you're not a golfer. <laughs> Because the highest court in the land just ruled 9-0 <laughs> against your case. Against your case. And ultimately, this decision leads open or leaves open the door for Congress to act to pass authorizing legislation. Uh, but we know that Congress is a nearly non-functioning body. So ultimately, it will be up to the American voters to save our democracy in November. How terrible. Of course, I mean, Congress is generally a non-functioning body, but of course, the detail that both she and the previous CNN stooge left out there is that the Republicans have the majority in the House. So this is fantasy. This is fantasy. Right. You're right. just trying to soften the blow because right. you, you know your viewers are in shambles. So you're just trying to give them something. Hey, maybe, maybe. But you know who actually leveled with them? The Queen Bee, the mother, Rachel Maddow. Let's take a look what she had to say. The courts are not going to help. The law will be a sidebar to the main decision. You will make this decision. The only way this decision will be made is by you picking one, by you vo volunteering and donating and campaigning and deciding it matters enough to you to not only vote, but to help, to help your candidate try to win. The Republican Party really, really is amazing right now. But the only thing that will stop them is Democrats winning instead. Period. Full stop. Thank you, United States Supreme Court, for the clarification of the campaign. If we didn't... <laughs> I love that at the end. Thank you, Supreme Court, for the clarification. We did not need any clarification. We who are not under your spell, we are not, we who are not propagandized by this sort of bullshit corporate media, did not need any clarification because A, we knew that this ruling would go as it did, and B, we are comfortable because we believe in democracy and you don't. We are very, very comfortable with the idea that uh, whoever gets the most votes in the most states and gets the 270 votes on November 5th wins the presidency. That's how it goes. That's democracy here. That's democracy here. That's the way it works. Like, what are you talking about? Well, now it's in the voters' hands. As <laughs> yeah. if that's like a dire thing. Like, what the fuck well, are you talking? You guys are supposed to be the ones who love democracy. And you're saying... Oh, the court's not going to step in and disqualify our adversary. We're going to have to now get more votes than him. I hate to tell you this, folks, but our democracy is on the line. And to make matters worse, we're going to have to outvote our opponents if we want power. Like, wow. Wow. Uh, yeah, it is. Um, it is really amazing. Uh watching them just just essentially uh concede that they have right. no <laughs> exactly. that th that that All they right, we give up we're gonna have to they vote they, they have no real yeah. belief that people have a right to choose their <laughs> right. leaders at exactly. the same exact time that they're beating up on on the poor uh, rural voters yeah uh you know and i i gotta say on that matt walsh made a good point and we didn't even catch this the reason they framed that as rural voters when they really mean poor voters is they can't say that. That's what they actually. Well, they'll never say. It. Yeah, right. Poor, that's what right. they actually mean. That's what that's about. That's actually this this classist thing. But 
that's why they say rural voters. It's a it's a euphemism. What right. they really mean is poor voters. Exactly. There are, there are some very rich people in rural parts of the country. That's not what they're talking about. Right. Um. But uh. But yeah, you also had Jim Acosta. We didn't have we, if if uh that clip. Oh, is we could out have done there. the whole show on this tonight. Yeah. There are yeah, a Jim, million Jim, other clips. Jim, Jim Acosta lamented that Trump has the right to appeal. And um, and he actually, he said, this was on CNN, I can't remember who he was he was bouncing off of, but he said, you know, and it's just terrible that, that Donald Trump gets the right to appeal. And the person he was talking to, that was too crazy for them. And they were like, well, you know, everyone has the right to appeal. And he said, well, but not everyone gets to exercise it. Well, okay, so the problem isn't that I guess what you're saying is people without Trump's resources don't get to exercise their full legal rights. The problem is that Donald Trump does. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, just completely upside down, completely batshit and bonkers. And this is all a meltdown that they're having because they're going to have to outvote Donald Trump. Here's a short piece of video. And, and, and this, before you get into that, this is one thing they never seem to realize. I remember saying this back in 2016. It was the first time I'd ever had stirrings like this. When I would argue with, with the Hillbots, it made me want to vote for Trump. It really did. Because they were so loathsome that God, like anything that would make them cry on election night, seemed like a good idea and we still watch those compilation oh, yeah. videos in sad times just to cheer us up right Th those never get old as a uh, as a dopamine hit right um watching them now i feel the same way man i'm like they make me want to vote for trump and i said that back then i said this to a lot of libs i said hey for me who is on the left who is not in a position where I live in a factory town that used to be prosperous and is now a meth addicted hellhole. I'm not in that position. And you people make me want to vote for Trump. I am quite sure if I was in that position, I'd be voting for Trump. Right. There is absolutely no question in my mind. You are creating his voters. Yes, indeed. Indeed. Um, absolutely. We've all, we've all felt that from time to time. Um, but I just want to play a very brief uh, piece of video to close this segment out uh, because this kind of gets to why the Democrats are so afraid of the prospect of actually having to win the election without disqualifying Donald Trump. Here's a Morning Joe segment. Uh, this is a sort of Hollywood Squares layout they got going here. Draw your eyes to the guy in the bottom right-hand corner. He's the one running his mouth. It's like a 50-50 shot. And, you know, maybe things will be a little bit better than that. Maybe we'll get all the way to 55-45 by November. You know, your lips to God's ears. But it's really disconcerting. So people think, well, there has to be something better. And th there isn't. This is it. Joe Biden's going to, um, Joe Biden is the nominee, and you're going to learn to love it, America. Jonathan, I couldn't agree, I, I, I could, I could agree with you more. And so Biden, funny now, is it? Not so funny now, is it, that you're actually going to have to beat Donald Trump on Election Day. This is why they are as paralyzed as they are. Because when they say you're going to have to learn to love it, they don't just mean that you're stuck with this doddering old man with no charisma who can't finish a thought. They mean this is as good as America can be. That's been their message since Biden took office. That's why the Build Back Better uh, negotiations, if you want to call them that, because Jayapal was just bullshitting us the whole time with the hold out for the good deal, don't pass the bad deal along with the good deal. Um, that's why MSNBC was praising Manchin and the soon-to-be-retiring Kristen Cinema throughout those exchanges because they understand that there's only so far progress can go, and they understand this is the end of the line. That's why mm -hmm. the quote-unquote extremists are always w likely to win in the end because what you call extremists, they would call ambitious. They would say they're forward thinking. They actually have momentum behind their ideas. They actually want to do something. You don't have to like what they want to do, uh, but they actually have direction. They have political momentum. You can't beat momentum with 
stasis, which is what the liberals are trying to do. America so is already as as great. <laughs> exactly. America is already great. That's their ethos. And that is never going to win in the end against candidates who represent some aspirational vision. Right. You can right. only counter aspiration with your own aspiration. That's why the counter to Donald Trump in 2016 was Sanders if they wanted to win, because that represented another aspirational right. vision. Now they're saying, well, this is it, America. This is what we got. Austerity, censorship, and genocide. That's the program. Can't do much about it. So it's either that or you lose your democracy, even though we're the party that just was totally unanimously rebuked at the Supreme Court for illegally trying to remove our competition from the ballot. That's how absurd their case is. That's what they're left with right now. Uh yeah, I don't, I don't know if you saw, I dropped a little video today walking around uh, New Orleans and I lamenting the uh, the monoculture of the upper classes that has come to take over every place in America that's urban. You know, every urban place in America is the same fucking place now. It's got right. Whole Foods, it's got a fucking pliable place, it's the same shit everywhere you go, really everywhere you go. Even New Orleans has been overrun right. by this. Um, those are the people who they want, and those are the only people they want. People outside of that are an inconvenience. They only want these very shallow consumerist, uh, voters who are just going to get on board with that whole program, right? Just work, make money, consume have the right opinions, buy the right products, keep their opinions within these lines. Trump represents the horror of everyone who's been left out of that vision. Exactly. And that's most, and that's most people. Yes. I mean, if, if more of those people voted, it wouldn't even be a question, but too many of them are voting. And that's why they've become so anti-democratic that that's why I almost want to read this book because I'm very curious how they came to the conclusion, how they did these studies, that white rural voters are the most hostile to democracy. Because I've seen studies saying that centrist voters are actually the most hostile to democracy. Yes. Yes. Well, you wrote a whole article about that way back when. It was the first one, one of the first ones you ever did. Yeah. Way back, yeah. Way back. We should reprint that now. We should. Maybe we should republish that. That would be worth a revisit, I think, for sure. Uh, Bloodthirsty Mayonnaise, thanks for the 199. Liberals don't hate Donald Trump. They hate us. Thank you, Bloodthirsty Mayonnaise. Round of applause for Jake in the uh, producer booth taking Rumble Rants. I know we got some Rumble Rants. Don't worry. We'll get to everything. Thank you, Jake. Appreciate you. Pickle the Pirate had to vote for Marianne Williamson today. Virginia doesn't allow uncommitted, so she was the only ceasefire on the ballot. Felt bad, so did a crystal reading later on. <laughs> look at that. Pickle the Pirate, a Marianne supporter. Hey, look, Marianne, we got some of your people on our show. How do you like that? How do you like Thanks. that? She'll be thrilled to know that. I'm sure I will tell her that next time I see her at the next rally. I'll say, hey, listen, I'm not propagandizing against you. I'll have you know Pickle the Pirate pulled the lever for you in Virginia. Uh, P. Walker, <laughs> thanks for the five bucks. Looks like Newland resigned from the State Department and replaced by the feckless twit that botched the Afghani withdrawal. Yippee. Yeah, we're going to uh, mention Victoria Newland a little bit later uh, in the program. Not much later, but thank you. Yep, we did catch that. Uh, Puck971. Gents, love the show. I went to dinner party and during cocktails, all my liberal friends did repeat all the talking points you would uh, read about the New York Times and New Yorkers. The vibe uh, was, why do plebes love Trump? Yeah, that's uh, the that's the script, man. That's the script. Uh, you uh, know, I haven't been around that in a while. You know, I don't I don't meet people anymore. You know, I, I don't I don't I don't associate with people anymore, so I don't really get exposed to that very often. But I believe you. I believe you. This is the funny thing about Keaton. Keaton is a very nice um misanthrope yes i'm a nice mice he's a very warm compassionate misanthrope yeah i love people as long as i don't have to be around them it's you know? a, that's what charles yeah. bukowski said yeah ah, i don't hate people i just seem to feel better when they're not around yeah, i just feel better when you're not around exactly <laughs> it's brilliant 
that's the way it goes. Kenman, thanks for the 279. Cone Pop was a bad ice cream, and I licked him. Thank you, Kenman. Uh, nothing in ruling, says president. Also, no insurrection, but establishment likes scary words. Yeah, they just, right, exactly. So th th they just, they didn't rule there. They just said, look, you don't have the right to decide whether a candidate for federal office is on the ballot because this is a matter of national importance. Like I said, I ain't no lawyer, folks, but uh, I could see that one coming pretty far, pretty far away. Um, Janice Anderson should be interesting to see if third parties can effectively use this ruling to prevent Dems and Republican state boards of elections from throwing third party federal candidates off various state ballots. Good point, mm. Janice. Good point. Mm. You know, you always come up with these good insights and, and add these thoughts. That is another one. That is a very, very interesting super chat. Thank you very much for it. Uh, let's go to a couple of rumble rants here. Got quite a few. Thank you for your generosity this evening. Thank you for your support. Did AOC realize that one day the ruckus would be against her? Yeah, that's what Jose <laughs> said. Well deserved for her refusal to call it a genocide. She lied to the activists saying she did call it a genocide. Oh, yeah, we'll get to that. She's Nancy 2.0. We will get to that. Yep. Believe me. Um, okay. <laughs> Roy the Goy says, During the previous broadcast, Russell stepped on my rant by flashing his gaudy beads at the camera. <laughs> in retaliation, I must impose sanctions in the form of an 80% reduction of my rumble rants. <laughs> this is Roy. We're being sanctioned by Roy the Goy. Roy the Goy. You, you are tough for a Goy. I got to say, that is very non-goy of you to do that. that that's uh, one might almost call it passive aggressive. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, T-Bone, thanks for the five bucks. Russell, if you're still in Greece, you should visit my hometown of Kanya, Crete. You should check out all of Crete, actually. Love you guys. Well, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I haven't been in I, Greece I, for about seven months. Um, well, like yeah yeah i got yeah. back in october yeah. um i did i did go to crete i loved it i went to Heraklion um so that i could go to the palace and uh but i really loved uh matala the beach uh town down there awesome we'll take a few more of these and then we got more stuff to do obviously a hamilton thanks for the five bucks i live in wisconsin getting hammered with dem party <laughs> propaganda ever since non-voters like me flipped wisconsin to trump in 2016 appreciate shows like yours for existing well we appreciate you thank Mr. you hamilton thank you thanks jm for the thumbs up and thanks cheryl i'm still laughing the women's march was the sun <laughs> of protest marches indeed that was a good one um okay all right we will get to all of our uh super chats and rumble rants uh i'm just gonna time. say that this is the coffee you would drink in the apocalypse because it was all you could find in the abandoned house you rummaged through oh yeah <laughs> shit this fucking place doesn't Garbage. have a coffee maker man i'm like reduced to instant coffee here oh, it's tough. either that or a keurig and i it, that's even worse I don't know why anybody uses those. It fucking sucks. Yeah, instant coffee is no good. I don't like instant coffee. I was never a fan. That's um, terrible. All right, we're going to go a little out of order because I don't want to do two long segments in a row. I want to break it up. And this one is more on the domestic politics front again. Um, so now that uh, Donald Trump is back on the ballot, Joe Biden has an election to win. And man of the people, class warrior Sean Fain talked big game about how our endorsement is going to be earned and we demand a ceasefire and then a few weeks later said oh never mind we endorse joe biden here he is appearing in a video that biden himself tweeted out in person to biden's face look at this groveling from uaw president sean fain it's the election both of these candidates the top two candidates have been in this position yes and the body of work speaks for itself you look at donald trump Every time he's had the opportunity, he blamed the American worker. And you look at President Biden, every time he's had the opportunity, he bet on the American worker. He stood yes. with the American worker. Yes. That's our fight going forward. And we're going to do everything in our power to get this man reelected. Yes. Okay. First of all, that's just obviously factually wrong. He invoked a hundred year old law to crush a railroad strike. As, uh, yes, friend of show Steph Zamorano tweeted out about that. Oh, she did. OK, good. Yeah, yeah. Because that's just factually wrong. He did not stand with the workers. He could have intervened to stop that railroad strike by imposing terms that the workers wanted. Right. 
uh, what that uh, Railway Labor Act says is that the United States government can impose terms on a dispute regarding that industry because of the importance that that industry remain up and running. But it doesn't say you have to side with management. He could have sided right. with labor. Right. He well, sided well, with, that, well, against, that's, against labor. Right. That was a real opportunity to support labor. Showing up to march, that's called campaigning. That's yeah. called a campaign stunt. When he yeah. had the opportunity to do something substantive, he did not. He, he did the opposite. Did the opposite. He crushed, he crushed the strike. He crushed the strike and imposed management's terms. And then they did this fake thing where the squad tried to get them, what was it, four sick days instead of the seven that they wanted. So obviously that's just factually wrong. But the thing that really comes to mind here is that this is the first video I've seen of Sean Fain since the Michigan primary. Obviously the UAW. He got has, his mind right. Yeah, well, he got his mind right. And obviously the state of Michigan has a huge number of UAW workers. So what if instead of doing bullshit gas, you're going to get your mind like right. And I mean, <laughs> right. What if instead of doing these bullshit gaslighting videos like this, what if the UAW endorsed the uncommitted campaign? Then you'd have probably double the amount of uncommitted votes that you had. You made the Democrats pretty scared with 100,000 uncommitted votes. Imagine this guy actually stuck to what he knew was the right thing, because not only did they withdraw, withhold their endorsement for Joe Biden for some time, but they called for a ceasefire before endorsing Joe Biden and then endorsed him anyway, even though he obviously, as we all know, has not brokered a ceasefire. Think of the impact it would have had if UAW said, we encourage all of our members to write uncommitted in the state of Michigan. That would have been twice as big as it was. Instead, he falls in line. It seems like everyone yep. Yep. in a position to really shake things up, every one individual who accrues that much influence and that much power, caves. It's almost like mm -hmm. what Tucker said was true. He says there's no such thing as fuck you money, only fuck you poverty. When you get to a place in society or within an institution or an organization where you have something to lose, you act in a way that says you don't want to lose it. And this is why, whether mm -hmm. it is politicians, whether it's philanthropists, whether it's labor leaders, whether it's anybody, you cannot invest in leaders anymore. I mean, it's it sucks, right? Leadership is a good quality, but it's a quite elusive thing in these times, is it not? Because it seems like everybody who gets to that point falls in line and caves. What if the UAW actually stood with the Dearborn people? and said, mm -hmm. we're with you. We want a ceasefire, vote uncommitted. Instead, we get this fucking bullshit. Let me play it one more time. It's only it's only 25 seconds. Let's just play it one more time. This election. The beauty of this election. Both of these candidates, the top two candidates, have been in this position. Yes. And the body of work speaks for itself. You look at Donald Trump, every time he's had the opportunity, he blamed the American worker. And you look at President Biden, every time he's had the opportunity, he bet on the American worker. He stood yes. with the American worker. Yes. That's our fight going forward. And we're going to do everything in our power to get this man reelected. Yes. Hey, what a, what a, what a piece of uh, shit. Um, you know, foreshadowing a little bit, I, I think we're going to wind up doing like a little bit of a special episode for you guys. So do your homework, go to Netflix. If you have it, hope you do. And uh, check out American Conspiracy, The Octopus Murders. And I'll tell you, you watch that and it, you know, gets into a reporter who was killed, who was kind of tracking an inner kind of rogue deep state government involved in drug dealing and arms trafficking with people like Casper Weinberger and George Bush, just, you know, real bohemian growth, creepy shit. And there's some pretty good evidence. I, I, I've said this for a long time, man. I, I have always wondered when you get to a certain position where you can really rock the boat, do they, do they have a sit down with you? Like, Hey man, you know, you could live to a ripe old age or, you know, you, we could Paul Wellstone you, man. You know, what do you, what do you want to do? I, I, I honestly wonder, I honestly wonder because Really? Okay. So assume you don't have that kind of threat. What does he have to lose really by sticking to his guns? What? 
Like if there, if there's nothing going on there and I'm not saying it has to be physical, but what do they threaten them with? Because it's too consistent. And I don't see that the rewards they get from it are so great that you can explain it just in terms of avarice. It just doesn't add up. It doesn't add up that every single Corey Bush, every single AOC, that none of them, none of them stick to it. None of them are principled. It just doesn't make sense unless there is some kind of threat that when you get to a certain point, you get a talking to. I mean, you could be right. I mean, there's no way to obviously prove that or disprove that. You know, um, I think, though, you know, incentives create themselves past a certain point. Like, it, things just accrue a certain but moment. But all of them? All well, of there's them? very few of them to begin with. There's very, very few of them. And, mm-hmm. you know, most of the people who have the discipline to actually be, you know, Mr. Smith um you know don't get that far like the system selects the people who are most likely to cave when it counts and you say why do all of them cave when it counts well again i think all of them is not really all of them right like the aocs represent the top half of one percent of people who try to be an aoc right i mean i don't mean to uh well but what i'm saying is i'm sure he wouldn't mind me i'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying this because he himself said i'm unlikely to win but you know jose vega right there's an example guy running outside the two-party system right running trying to get in there now he's the kind of guy who i trust not to sell out if he got in there but that's why he's almost certainly not going to get in there because he's running on a third party candidate and if he ever got close APAC would come in and crush him and like i said i'm not i don't think i'm out of line in saying that he said that himself he's not likely to win he says i'm not promising anybody anything right um but that's a certain example of the system just selecting people who are most likely just in the way that the mainstream media functions that way right they select the people who are most likely to fall in line when it matters okay everybody else is just sort of naturally filtered out yes and no um i'm not talking about all the people who don't get in that position i'm talking about the rare case where i do not believe that the system selected for corey bush Um, I know some people will disagree with me. I don't believe the system selected for AOC. I think they much preferred Joe Crowley. I think they much preferred, um, I forget his name, but Bush was running against a political dynasty there in her district. I forget what his name was. I don't think they selected for them. And I don't think, you know, let's focus on Corey Bush to avoid the CIA questions around AOC. Um, I don't think she went in there as an op. I don't, you know, anything I've no. never even seen anybody say anything like that. Uh, Ilhan Omar, Rashida Tlaib. I, I think they came in with good intentions. I I've, I've said, cause I didn't see her in an interview for, for a couple of years. And the next time I saw Ilhan Omar, she looked like they had given her a frontal lobotomy. Like she looked like a different person. She's she really is. She interviews like this now. <laughs> Uh, what do they, what, what, I, I just can't believe all of them wind up like about that a very small with, group of without people, something. You're ultimately talking about a very small group of people. And when I say they select them, I don't mean they're a plant or they're an op. I just mean the system selects people. Well, but who that's can what I'm saying. I, the system did attention. not select for them. No, they they did not. By but, they, I but don't they, mean they. But I, they all caved. By they, I don't mean people who behind the scenes pick and choose who gets to rise and who doesn't. I mean just like a media ecosystem, right? I, I mean politics is its own ecosystem. Labor is its own ecosystem. You know, people who are willing to organize are usually willing to eat a lot of shit. Like if you are an organizer, you're usually willing to eat a lot of shit. I'm not willing to eat a lot of shit. I don't work well with people. That's why I do a podcast with you and you're about all I can handle. Right? <laughs> I could not be a politician. I could not lead a movement. I do not collaborate with others. Right. Um, you know, and so it, the system would select me out. It would select me out. Doesn't mean there's a group of shadowy people who would say Keaton's not coming in. The system itself, the nature of the thing 
filters me out. What? Okay, so what? I mean, what you're arguing is if you have a personality style that would allow you to organize a campaign, you're particularly susceptible to corruption. I I don't really agree with that. I I don't agree with that. Um, I I and I certainly don't think they wanted those three people at the very least to win. Um, Sean Fain, I'm not as clear. I I've heard that there was somebody further to his left that he ran against, that he actually was not the furthest, mo- furthest left in that, in that campaign. Yeah. So I don't know as much about him to comment on that. Maybe he was always kind of like a shell like that. Um, but in terms of what I do know better, the history of these squad members, um, the original squad, not the new Avengers, you know, Jamal Bowman's just a fucking bonehead. But when you talk about the original ones, yeah, man, the fact that they all caved, you just have to wonder now, it ju- it, you know, it could just be as simple as, you know, career threats and, Hey, it's easier to go along to get along and you wind up just rationalizing it better. I'm here than somebody else and I can get some good done that somebody else might not. And at least I'm going to try to do the right thing. And somebody else like Joe Crowley in this office will do the wrong thing with it. Uh, Maybe it's as simple as that, but honestly it is so broad. It's such a consistent pattern. It just mathematically you you feel the sample set is so small that you can just explain it as simple. I'm not saying you can. I'm just saying that it's possible. I'm not saying you're wrong. It's, it's possible. I can't say you're wrong. I don't know. It's possible, but I don't know, man. We're we're, we're well. I'm, I'm sure you're, you're not wrong. I'm like, sure you'll like. I'm sure you'll like it. Watch that documentary. We're gonna do a special episode on it. You know, it's fresh in my mind. But I'm like, yeah, man. I mean, maybe they just freaking threaten to whack <laughs> these people. <laughs> I mean, honestly, maybe they're like, hey, see the dude across the parking lot. You want that guy to be the last thing you ever see? Okay. Well, then shut the fuck up. I mean, if that's true, I mean, the thing about these kinds of questions is if that's true, what is even the point of knowing it, right? Like, if that's true, what is the point of knowing it? Because where does that take you, right? Like, where does that lead you? It, it leads you to the same place you're in now, right? I'm, so I'm just, that's why I, I don't I, look, I'm just going to say kind of if anything happens to me, it was, it was, it was not suicide. Yeah. I'm just saying, like, you know, you ask these kinds of things, like, at a certain point, enough of the conspiracy is out in the open to the point where mm-hmm. you can wonder what what else there is, you mm-hmm. know? That's like wondering how deep the iceberg goes under the water. Right. I, mean, you, I mean, I guess it's an interesting question, mm-hmm. but operationally, you know there's a hunk of ice in your way right here, right? And And, and functionally speaking... That's all that's really necessary to know for sure. These other things you're never going to know for sure anyway. So what is the point of obsessing over them? Now, when I say obsessing, I mean I, I, in, I think, in terms I think, of having that consume the way you view political interactions. I'm not saying they're not worth entertaining. I mean, you know me. I dabble in all kinds of conspiracy theories. I'm not averse to that. I'm not saying that like I don't look down on people who do that, but I don't I don't think that is the key to understanding because I think there's enough of this stuff as George Carlin said, you don't need formal conspiracies when interests sure. converge, right? Well, I I I think strategically it's worth it's worth knowing if it were true. Yeah, I don't think you should obsess on it or anything really. You know, I mean, it'd be you can worth get very for you before you run for president of the tour guides union. Yeah, (laughs) it's 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 worth knowing if you're involved in politics, like if that's an explanation, sure, it would be worth knowing. That would be a very invaluable thing to know. You you can't fight an enemy without knowing what you're fighting. All right. Scott George, thanks for the five bucks. How many charges in direction insurrection zero? So therefore it never happened. Well, that's the other thing. Trump himself was never charged with the crime that would have disqualified him from the ballot. That's a point we didn't make in this segment, but absolutely uh, a relevant one. So thank you for that. Christos, thanks for the two bucks. Appreciate you. Uh, how do we infiltrate this system to take it over? Well, that was a question we were just kind of talking about uh, in that last little bit. There. This, is, this, is what I, this is what I always say about um, 
you know, are communist friends. That That is something I will concede to them. Yeah, they are the only ones who ever beat the capitalists. Like, it is hard to imagine how would you take the power away from people like Jeff Bezos without an actual revolution? How would right. you do it otherwise? Well, we're going to get a little bit into that uh, a little bit later. We have a segment that's, you know, somewhat about that. Um, but thank you for that. This account pending review, thanks to the five bucks. They rigged the system, so will but never accounted for maybe facing the greatest con man that ever lived. Thank you, Charles. Thank you for the two bucks. Do we run undercover people to switch at a signal? I don't think you run anybody. I don't I don't think electoral politics is is the answer at all. And uh, we're going to do a segment on that in a little bit. Um, oh, let's get our virtual cowbell out from Landrew. Thank you. That's very damn. Funny. Yo, thank you for the one hundred dollars. Thank you for the logic in these illogical times. Vote no on genocide. Joe. Well, that's very kind of you, Landrew. Thank you. Thank you, Landrew. I submit to the will of Landrew. Only the trackies got that. Uh, Thank you very much. That is very kind. Uh, Muhammad, thank you, Muhammad. Found you guys a few months ago and have been watching ever since. You guys are great. Cheers. Thank you, Muhammad. Thank you. Uh, B-Man, thanks for the two bucks. Rumor Hillary is running. Yeah, that's not going to (laughs) happen. It's either Biden or it'll be Gavin Newsom. That that is a a non-starter uh, for sure. Abiding seventy one. Thanks for the buck. Ongoing genocide and mutilation of hundreds of thousands is unfortunate. Yes, but don't forget about the NLRB appointments. Vote blue. Number two. <laughs> Thank you for that. Malabea started now, off now spicy that, boys. That is one Thank privileged you. position, man. Yes. <laughs> Indeed. Well, he's kidding, obviously. Yeah, no, um, I know. I know. Yeah. No, I know. Um, okay. Uh, that's the closest we'll get to seeing Rachel's O face, says Dave Morrison. Thank you, Dave. Singing Bicycle. I refer, prefer to think of myself as a warm, compassionate lysanthrope. There you go. Thank you, Singing Bicycle. Appreciate that. Um, okay. Let's move on to segment number three. Jake, we'll hit the patron scroll after this one, my friend, just to prep you. I know I didn't prep you for that before the show. Uh, But uh, big crowd in here, 1733 on YouTube, 1326 over on Rumble. Please hit that like button. Hit that follow button over on Rumble. Hit that subscribe button here on the YouTube side of things. Um, Folks, uh, Ukraine is uh, not in good shape uh, right now. And um, I saw a CNN report earlier today that was too long to feature here but uh it was quite the sad scene you know they're walking around to all these villages interviewing these older people who have lived there their whole lives and you know these are just modest people living their lives they don't want a war they don't want to be dragged into anything and the stories were just horrible like they soldiers ukrainian soldiers would come and like commandeer their apartment or their house and use it to fire from russians upon like it's just a horrible situation and it has to end uh but the establishment doesn't want it to end um the neocons in both the democrat and the republican parties uh are hell-bent on getting this 60 billion dollars through for what well, let's hear for what. Marco Rubio is going to try to explain this, and uh, you'll see what kind of bang-up job he does. Listen to this whirlwind of bullshit. Now, here's what I do know. There is no way that the Russian Federation takes Ukraine, all of Ukraine, half of Ukraine. And that was that was Putin's goal from the beginning, was no, to it carve it up no, and, it into half, at least half the country. No, it was an absolute, total lie. The goals at the beginning were the peace terms they could have agreed to. I've said this a million times on this show, but I have to say it every time, because if they're going to lie about it every time, I have to tell the truth about it every time. Neutral Ukraine, recognition of uh, the Crimea as Russian, and independence for those eastern separatist regions. That's it. Kiev was not part of the conversation. Half, most, all Ukraine, not part of the conversation. Absolute lie. Including Kiev. Well, well he's, say, he's saying that so he can, uh, you know, it's like Vietnam. Well, actually, we're, uh, we uh, control the South. Uh, we right. won. Right. Victory. They have to make Victory. it look like they've made some progress. Right. Like right. it's not a one-sided loss. Right. Uh, that this wasn't all in vain. To half, at least half the country, including Kiev, that's not going to happen. 
That's not going to happen. On the other side of it, we have the reality of it is that Ukraine is small compared to Russia in terms of size and its ability to bring scale, its ability to force conscript people. Now that's interesting because I knew fuck all about Russia or Ukraine before February of 2022. You know, I'm a millennial. When I grew up, the wars were all in the Middle East. Uh, I didn't know shit from Shinola about Eastern Europe, but I knew that. I knew Russia was bigger than Ukraine, and that's why Ukraine couldn't win. So if idiot, ignorant moron like me could say that two years ago, maybe you guys could have said that two years ago and saved half a million lives, but no. So neither, neither kind. This is I'm just being honest, and, I've, and you know, in the past I have tried not to talk about this publicly because I thought it undermined uh, the the leverage that Ukraine had. But now it's the reality. Neither side is going to be able to achieve victory as defined in the most idealistic terms. So then the question becomes: If in fact there's going to be a negotiated settlement, who's going to have the leverage here? Is it going to be Putin or is it going to be Ukraine? And I want Ukraine to have the most amount of leverage possible when the time comes for those conversations to happen. They're not going to have leverage if Putin feels like he has the upper hand, that he's, he has ways to gain and, and can force Ukraine into a situation where they become basically a satellite state, which is what he wants. He wants them to be like Belarus. Okay, all right, all right. Take take a breath. Take a breath for a second. Have a sip of water, okay? I gotta, I gotta stop you there. <laughs> Listen. Whatever that, you nice, think about nice it, reference for the hardcore <laughs> yeah, politics. Right, for the hardcore politics. Take a breath, all right? You're talking a little fast. Take a drink. Have a Have a seat for a second. Whatever you think about Vladimir Putin, whether you like him or, or hate him, whatever your hatred is for Putin, I could tell you this, and you must acknowledge this, because this is objectively true. He is much, much smarter than the brain-dead idiots in Florida who voted for you, Marco Rubio. Much smarter. <laughs> and if you think that $60 billion out the door from this country to Ukraine is going to give them some leverage in negotiations— that they don't have now, then you are lying to yourself and whoever is watching you. You think Vladimir Putin is going to give you one more inch of territory than he would right now if you give them $60 billion? You just said yourself they're outgunned and they're outmanned. $60 billion delays things a few months. That's all it does. Right. That doesn't increase well, Ukraine's well. leverage whatsoever whatsoever and these poor people in eastern ukraine like i said i watched this thing you got these old men i've been married to my wife we've lived here 52 years just a simple guy with a garden and a house he doesn't want this fucking hell brought on him like look what you're subjecting people to half a million people dead and injured already like what's going on in gaza is unthinkable it's sadistic it's evil it's horrific obviously um and you know i probably shouldn't even go into like comparisons but the reason I, I bring that up is because Gaza is 30,000 dead. Ukraine, you're talking about half a million dead and injured, right? Like I said, I don't mean to compare them, but I'm just saying Ukraine is much more sanitized in the media because we're, we're not seeing videos right. of carnage yeah. in Ukraine the way we see in Gaza, but that's real. You got hundreds of thousands of people whose lives are ruined, a country whose future which, is which a you dead know, end that, because you of know, these an interesting... pieces of shit who fucking lie through their teeth for two years saying they have a chance to win. They do not have a chance to win. How are they more pro-Ukraine than a guy like me who's saying, I want the people of Ukraine to live peacefully? Anyway, sorry, you were saying something? Uh, yeah, for one thing, you know, I hadn't really thought about this. Uh, you know, they have social media. Why aren't we seeing that? You well, know, like, why aren't why aren't they casualties, sending that I mean, out? this came out at the beginning of the war. Now, the look... Because so many young Ukrainian men have been drafted into the war, they don't count as civilian casualties because they're right. thrown on the front, right. front lines. In, but I'm in saying, combat. like, why aren't we getting, why aren't they uploading these videos of carnage in Ukraine? Yeah, because there's a whole lot of carnage. I, I, a whole um, lot of carnage. I, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. Like, why aren't we seeing that? Yep. Because we are seeing it from Gaza. Yeah. And this has been going on for two years now. You would think there'd be a lot of videos of carnage out of Ukraine. So I wonder why that is. We should research that. Maybe like, because why the media wants us to believe Ukraine videos? is winning. They want us to believe Yeah, yeah, but that's not to st – how's that going to stop the average civilian right, right. from uploading? No, that's a good right? question. Like, right? Like, so where are these videos? Um, but that – and to be clear, I'm not in any way questioning the carnage. I Like, I think there's carnage. I, I think it's strange right. that we're not seeing it. I, I'd like to know why that is.
Um, yeah, no, you know, I rented my, my, like half my apartment to a Ukrainian guy. I'm about to reoccupy the apartment. And he says his entire like town is gone. He's, he's from one of those frontline Eastern towns and he speaks Russian. So I think he might be more on that side of things. Uh, it's going to be interesting when I go home. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Well, you know, look, I said this at the beginning of the war, like whatever the political orientation of the people in the eastern regions are in 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 the Donbass, like the the ordinary person is just that ordinary. Right. Right. And whatever your politics are, most people are just ordinary people, no matter where you live, no matter who you pray to, no matter what color you are. Right. You just want to live your life. Sure. And uh, the people in this most people are not political, saw, right? Most people do not want to fucking die for NATO right. or right. die against right. NATO. They just right. want to be left the fuck alone. And so right. to impose this, to impose this horror on these people is just bone deep evil. And we've lost sight of just how evil this is, because another horrific evil has understandably, obviously Stolen right, the right. limelight, and obviously well, we, you know, I'm not like I said, I'm not trying to litigate which is more worthy of our focus. I'm saying they're both worthy of our focus because this right. is a horrible chapter in history. Two horrible chapters in history ushered in by this senile ice cream man, surrounded by the most vicious sociopaths on the planet. Yeah, that 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 would be a uh, fitting nickname for him. We, we should really replace Sleepy Joe with the ice cream. The man. ice cream man. That's what I'm calling him. I'm yeah. calling him the ice cream man that, now. That, that's, that's perfect. <laughs> that's he, it. From now until November, he is the ice cream man. The ice cream man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's it. Uh, okay. So with what Rubio is saying, the only result of that, it's not going to be to have more leverage with Putin, as you say. He's not giving up one inch of the territory that has been so hard won. Um, all it's going to do is get more Ukrainians killed. Yes. There, there, there was another article we were we were looking at, and we've we've talked about this a lot, both on our show and on Jimmy's show. They don't. They're out of people. They're out of people. It doesn't matter what ammunition you send them. We it, when we covered this two months ago, the average age of uh, the soldiers was forty two. What's it? What's it going to be in six months? Fifty. Yeah. Dude, man, I mean, I'm 54. I'll tell you, you put me out there on those front lines. I would not last very long. <laughs> like you can't, you cannot have an entire army being subjected to that kind of constant physical stress and torment. That's why they recruit 18 year olds. That's why they recruit people at that age who can physically take that kind of abuse. You can't be putting people in their 40s and 50s out on the front lines for months on end like that. Yeah. No. Um, so so what? It, 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 the the story that we were looking at, I, I sent this to you. Um, the reason they fired the the general they just fired um, was because he was telling them that their recruiting goals were unrealistic or they weren't going to be able to do it. So now they appointed a new general. And he can't solve it because you can't. What, what, what do you what do you got cloning that somewhere? It, it's not soluble. You don't have the fucking people. They're dead. How, how are you going to draft a million people? That's what they're talking about. Where are you going to get them from? This article got into also like Ukrainians who are within that age range who are like hiding out in apartments who are not going down onto the street. We showed a video on Jimmy's show of a guy being grabbed yeah, literally right off the, off the street. Yeah. They're afraid to go out on the streets. That's what they're down to. So why are you talking about giving them $60 million for what? To prolong that? Right, right. And and the just utter lie that that's going to increase their leverage. Of, of course not. Unbelievable. Of course not. 
Unbelievable. All right, let's let him finish. He wants to keep territory and then whatever's left over of Ukraine, he wants it to be a country that is forced to remain neutral and that in his orbit and sphere of influence. So I want Ukraine to have the most amount of leverage. And to do that, we have to help him. And I'm in favor of doing that. But we have to first take care of our country. So I, yes, I believe that we should help Ukraine, but only after we help America through our border. In the same way as Democrats are saying, we won't help Israel unless you help Ukraine. And because they're holding Israel as leverage and hostage over Ukraine. So at the end of the day, that's what I hope we can achieve here. And I think it begins by the president doing what he should do anyways, which is to reverse the executive orders that have caused this migrant crisis at our border. Wow. With messaging like that, I'm really surprised he didn't win the presidency in 2016. As our friend Nick Cruz would say, in shambles, in shambles. What an incoherence. As our British friends would say, it's it's shambolic. Shambolic, shambolic. Here's a much more concise read of the situation from Time Magazine. Ukraine can't win the war. There you have it. There you have it. A whole piece. We're not going to read this piece. Uh, but that pretty much tells you uh, what you need to know there. We'll what, read a what, every, bit. what everyone with any sense was saying two years ago. Yeah. The long-awaited counteroffensive last year failed. Russia has recaptured Avdivka, its biggest war gain in nine months. President Volodymyr Zelensky has been forced to quietly acknowledge the new military reality. The Biden administration's strategy is now to sustain Ukrainian defense until after the elections in the hope of wearing down Russian forces in a long war of attrition. Yeah, this strategy seems sensible enough. No, it doesn't but contains one crucially important implication and one potentially disastrous flaw, which are not yet being seriously addressed in public debates in the West or Ukraine. The implication of Ukraine standing indefinitely on the defensive, even if it does so successfully, is that the territories currently occupied by Russia are lost. Russia will never agree at the negotiating table to surrender land that it has managed to hold on the battlefield. They've secured oh, the territorial gains say. that they wanted. Again, that accepts the Marco Rubio bullshit premise that they wanted all of Ukraine. They did not. And so, as you can see, very simply here, they understand what's going on. You know who also might understand what's going on? Victoria Nuland, because she's quitting. Victoria Nuland, <laughs> third highest ranking U.S. diplomat and critic of Russia's war in Ukraine, is retiring. Anthony Blinken put out a statement about Victoria Nuland's retirement. Why don't we... Uh, Get this going here. <laughs> Set the mood. What makes Toria? See, he, he says she's Toria. He's on that that kind of basis uh, with her, oh, wow. I guess. Uh, wow. What what makes Toria wow. truly exceptional is the fierce passion she brings to fighting for what she believes in most: freedom, democracy, human rights, and America's enduring capacity to inspire. We're, we're talking about Victoria. Fuck the EU. Fuck the Newland. EU. Newland. Yeah. And promote those values around the world. These were wow. the principles that drove Toria when we first met more than 30 years ago. They are the same principles she has brought to her work as undersecretary and as acting we, uh, secretary Yeah, we might have uh, spent a couple of days blind drunk at a Holiday Inn, but uh, <laughs> yeah, you right. know, after that, we decided we work better as friends. <laughs> exactly. A role she filled seamlessly for seven months. Over the past three years, Toria has led this department on everything from addressing complex crises in the Shahel, Haiti, and the Middle East to broadening and strengthening America's alliances and partnerships across Europe and the Indo-Pacific. But it's Toria's leadership on Ukraine that diplomats and students of foreign policy will study for years to come. Is that right? Is that right? Is she the role model? Because the results in Ukraine wouldn't lend you to believe that uh, she's worth studying all that closely. Her efforts have been indispensable to confronting Putin's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, marshalling a global coalition to ensure his strategic failure. Again, what strategic failure? Ukraine uh, and helping Ukraine work toward the day when it will be able to stand strongly on its own feet democratically, economically, and militarily. I don't know how they're going to do that bullshit. when so many of the men who are childbearing age are gone. Like, I mean, yeah. it, it, once again, just a, an unbelievable and tragic disaster for Ukraine. Ushered well, in, wait, in part, wait. not fully, obviously, but in large part by Toria. 
Toria Newland. You know, we usually reserve this cue for uh, the recently deceased and horrific, but in her case, we'll make an exception. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Anyone's uh, going to burn in hell, it's Victoria Newland. Yeah. Uh, so there you have it. There you have it. An admission of defeat. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just, in, in, it just really incredible to see their case just fall apart in broad daylight there. Um, all right, let's go to some more super chats here. Um, P. Walker, thanks for the five bucks. Biden stepped up for the American worker and told the parliamentarian, told him to sit the fuck back down. <laughs> sit, I meant stumble and fall. Thanks, P. Walker. Appreciate that. Take a pick, 1313. Thank you for doing Jimmy's show so I can follow you. I like to call Lil Rishi Poison Sunak. Yeah, I thought of Poison Sunak. That sounds good. I like that name, too. Um, have John Kiriakou on. He talks about the threats. Yeah. Um, thank you, Jessica. I am familiar with uh, John Kiriakou. That, that, that would be it. That would be it. We're Facebook friends, actually. Oh, you are? Oh, cool. Yep. Cool. Uh, Roy the Goy says, Keaton, before taking my sanctions too lately, I suggest you consult Victoria Newland. She scoffed at my sanctions and is now ousted from her post. <laughs> A 40-year career of murder and mayhem in ruins. <laughs> and Roy says, Russell, I can assure you of my Goyish credentials. I buy all of my clothes from L.L. Bean and Eddie Bauer. Yeah, that's that's pretty much that's not bad. That's not bad. I can't I can't challenge you on that. Uh, T-Bone says, Roy the Goy and you listen to the Dave Matthews band. That's also evidence of Roy the Goy. Uh, no matter how paranoid or conspiracy minded you are, what the government is actually doing is worse than you imagine. William Bloom. Thank you, R.B. Ham. I, I think the audience is on my side on this theory. Again, I'm not. I'm not against you. I'm just saying. You know, like I said. Anyway, we, we've we've said it. Um, Jack's page. My husband is a retired railroader. Biden and UAW guy can f all the way off. Thank you, Jack's page. Thank you, Jack. Indeed, and that's the other thing that that's about that is that you know I'd like to see how the rank and file are actually divided amongst Biden, Trump, right? Um. No gods, no masters, abolish government, no more heroes. Thank you, DC. Appreciate you, my friends. Um, okay, why don't we go to uh, this next piece here. This is by Caitlin Johnstone, uh, wrote, I think, a very good article because it's Super Tuesday now, and so it is general election season for all intents and purposes after tonight. And uh, just as in 2016, there was a lot of arguing about who to vote for, whether to vote at all. Are you going to protest vote? Are you going to, you know, not vote? Are you going to do a write-in? 2020 was the same thing. And obviously, say no to Genocide Joe. No doubt about that. There's no question about that in my mind that that is the right thing to do. But I do think this was a really great little piece uh, that we'll read here. Nobody with real power cares if you refuse to vote for Biden. And this is an important red pill to take in. There's been a lot of talk in pro-Palestine circles about withholding votes for Biden in protest of his genocide in Gaza, which is, of course, fine. But the discourse around doing so often misses an important point. A lot of U.S. voters erroneously think they'd be punishing the Democrats for Gaza by costing them the election, mistakenly assuming Democrats care about winning. They don't. Losing an election costs Democratic Party leaders nothing. All the career politicians and political operatives at the top keep their careers either way. From their point of view, this is just a cushy job with sweet benefits, and they keep those win or lose. And obviously, Biden himself doesn't care. He'll have a comfortable retirement regardless of the outcome in November. And on some level, he's surely aware that it's nuts for a dementia patient to be in the White House anyway. <laughs> If the Democrats cared about getting your vote, they'd be trying hard to earn it. They're not trying because they don't care. The unelected empire managers who actually run the U.S. power structure also don't care who wins the election. They know they'll still get their murder and militarism and capitalism and imperialism no matter who gets sworn in next year, whether it's Biden or Trump or Harris or someone else. No one with any real power cares about your vote. 
And that's the real issue. That's the real point that keeps getting missed here. The problem is not that the wrong people keep getting elected. It's that the elections don't matter and voters don't have a say. Yes, it's that humanity is dominated by a murderous globe-spanning power structure loosely centralized around Washington, whose actual movements and behavior have effectively zero responsiveness to the will of the electorate. Preach. You're never Yeah, absolutely. You're never going to be able to vote your way out of this mess, and you're never going to be able to not vote your way out of this mess because the power of your vote has been undermined to a value of zero. Very good formulation there. That doesn't mean there's no way out of this mess. It just means there's no way to get out of this mess using the fake plastic diversion toy they handed you to shut you up and trick you into thinking you have a say. There are still plenty of other tools in the toolbox for forcing an evil power structure to stop doing evil things, but they require a whole lot of hands to bring about, and right now we don't have them. Too many people have been successfully propagandized into believing the status quo works and their government is basically good, or successfully manipulated into giving up on politics altogether and throwing their attention into other Thing. So I love this article, but I do want to plant a little flag at that paragraph because part of why I still think it's important to boycott Joe Biden is exactly for the reasons she's saying there. It's true what she's saying. No one in power mm -hmm. cares whether you yep. vote for Joe Biden yep. or don't vote for Joe Biden. Yep. But the people who are still asleep might care. The liberals who you need to either snap out of it or get the fuck out of the way, they care very much whether you vote for Joe Biden. And so in boycotting the Joe Biden ticket, you send a clear message to them. You can't have your fake plastic diversion toy called a Democratic White House without us. And we're not giving it to you because what's happening is repugnant and obscene. Mm -hmm. So that to me is the efficacy of withholding your vote for Joe Biden. She's correct about what she says. Yeah. You think Jake Sullivan gives a fuck if he gets a second term right. or the, if Trump's these guy guys, gets a second term? No, yeah, they don't they, care. When, but the when, people who need to be snapped out of their propaganda, they care. Yeah. When they are out of power, they just go on to corporate boards. They go into consultancies. They get gigs for Amazon. Uh, they they just go to Silicon Valley. Uh, that's it. They're fine either way. They make more money that way. Yeah, you, know, you do so, you do some resume building. You build up your millions over there. Then you go back into government next time your people are in charge. Yeah, no. Nah, and, and any way the cookie crumbles, their bread is buttered. Um, what Sh Schellenberger's article where he showed you had all these intelligence people who thought they were going to go work for Hillary. And when she didn't win, they all wound up forming and working for NGOs that became the censorship regime that under right. the guise of being independent are actually working for the government. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, so they'll end up somewhere. They'll end up somewhere. They'll end up they somewhere. They'll, they'll be fine. They'll they be, will fine. be fine. Uh, we'll read a little bit more of this because it's a short piece. So we'll read the whole thing. Before the people can begin using the power of their numbers to force real change, they're going to have to be awakened to the reality that everything they've been told about their government, their society, and their world is a lie. They've got to come to the understanding that the mainstream news media are nothing but propaganda, and they live under the most murderous and tyrannical regime on this planet. They've got to realize that this power structure does not ultimately serve their interests or the interests of their fellow human beings around the world. Only when enough eyes open to this reality can revolutionary change via direct action become possible. The good news is it's entirely possible to help get those eyes open. Everything you do to help share the truth with your fellow citizens and spread awareness of what's really going on pushes this possibility towards reality. The more people open their eyes, the more people there are to help open others. So this could snowball from impossible to probable to inevitable quite quickly. An entire globe-spanning empire rests on a closed pair of eyelids. Once they snap open, the whole thing will crumble, and from there we can begin building a healthy world together. Well said by the perennially brilliant Caitlin Johnston. Um, but that second part there reinforces what I said. Part of how you snap those eyeballs open 
is by freaking them the fuck out this year and saying, we are not voting for Joe Biden this year. That's it. We are not doing it. He has crossed our red line. Fuck you. You don't have to argue about it. Don't argue about it too much. You know, don't get mired in these debates. We've all seen the Twitter threads that go on for miles and miles and Facebook conversations and Reddit, this, that, the other. Just no, absolutely not. It's very simple. Why not? 30,000 people are dead, over 20,000 of whom are women and children. And so that's it. That's done. That ship has sailed. We're not doing it. You cannot cross that red line and ask for our vote, period. That's it. Let them fret as much as they want and hope that that distress you put them under opens their eyes and and ushers in the kind of momentum that she says is very much needed because it is. Um, just on Caitlin Johnstone, I, I, I would say with some confidence, as far as opinion writers on the left go, she's the best we have. Yeah, and the volume it, uh, of work is just it, incredible. Like, she writes almost every and day. And she consistently knocks it out of the park. Yeah. Like, it's amazing she can be that good w and that prolific right. at the same time. Like, there's never a, really a Caitlin Johnston article that doesn't flow well. Right? She never really... the the only And the only time I ever disagreed with something that she wrote... I, you know, her heart was in the right place. I think if you remember, there was a, there was a, one of those little mini, uh, internet meme flare ups. Cause they took the picture of the, of the students at the museum on their cell phones. And, uh, you know, everyone talked about how horrible it was that they're sitting in front of these great works of art and they're just sitting oh, there right. on their okay. cell phones. So, uh, she wrote, she wrote a very fanciful article where, you know, somebody, confronts one of these students and they confidently tell them no actually i'm looking up the entire history of art and no they're not <laughs> and and i actually responded to it i said you know i would love to believe that but it come on really you know that's not true that that's not what's happening in that picture uh other than that literally i've never disagreed with anything she ever wrote um so this, this is typical, and that's part of what makes her stand out. She's so insightful getting right to the heart of the yes. matter with this. Yes. Nobody, nobody else has framed it quite this way, and she's absolutely right. They don't care, but I also think that you're right. The libs do. Like, in, in the end, is that accelerationist? I get. I mean, I guess... I guess it, well, it's, it's not. I mean, not exactly. I mean, I understand what you're saying, but not exactly um, because, you know, it, it's not a matter of like crashing things into the ground. It's just a matter of opening eyeballs. Right. And if the only way to open eyeballs is to abandon the Democratic Party, then you have to do that. I don't consider Trump a downgrade. Like, I don't consider you got an accelerationist point. for yes, that reason. That's like, true. it's not a downgrade. That's true. <laughs> like, that's true. It's actually materially, probably, it, it, right. ever so slightly, by accident, better. I mean, Donald Trump gave a horrific quote to Fox News. I don't know if it was today or yesterday. But they said, you know, like, a lot of these people who are voting uncommitted, they're not going to vote for you because you're you're a stronger ally of Israel than Joe Biden's. Like, what do you think about what Israel's doing in Gaza? And he says, well, they have to finish the problem. You know, just a completely heartless right. piece of shit like he's, well, well that he's, that's he's, why he's, he's, he's always... a monster on that front so like i'm not telling you it's going to be better under trump because he's right. a better guy i'm saying with trump right. there is the randomness factor there's a chance he'll have a falling out with netanyahu over some bullshit thing and cut off funding if another one of these things flares up like the, it's not a great chance i'm not saying it's because of any conviction of his with him there's a randomness factor with Biden, there's no randomness factor. We know where Jake Sullivan is taking the world. Well, that's he's what that's what clear. Putin said. He prefers Biden because he's more predictable. Right, he's more predictable. Exactly. Now, now, is he playing head games? Maybe, but is the fact that Biden is a more reliably predictable person to have to face off against than Trump? Of course it is. Right. Of course it is. I mean, Trump. Yes, you're right. You you never know. Trump could turn around on a dime and say. Uh, you know, uh, we're, we're, I don't understand why we're paying for everything in uh, Israel. Right. Yeah, they, uh, why don't, why don't they pay for it? Why, right. don't, why don't another country? Yeah, sure, that could definitely happen. Um, and, and yes, you're right. It's not accelerationist in the sense that I think Trump's going to do a worse job. 
I mean, how right. much how much how much worse a job how much could worse you really can you fucking do? How, how much worse could you do? Yeah. Um. So I do agree with that. But you are talking about being a political actor who's, um, you know, trying to kind of force people to wake up to the fact that the system doesn't work. So in right. some sense, you are trying to crash the system, but you're trying to crash it so that something better can take its place. Sure thing. So in some sure sense, thing. that's an accelerationist But motivation. the act of boycotting Biden is in this case to just scare the libs, just scare right. them straight. Just right. saying, no, you've reached the end of the line here. You've reached the end of the line. And we're not turning back no matter what. Um, all right. Let's tell you, we got a couple more. These are not long ones, but uh, we got a couple more segments here. Dan in the Outback. Russia had to fight off a U.S. NATO-controlled Ukraine regime off their most important foreign border. It's just that simple. Sure. Thanks, sure. Dan. And we, um, all, we all know what the United States would, would do of course, if yeah. Mexico were in a similar position. Of course. There, there'd be no Mexico. No, absolutely. I'm just saying, you know, uh, this is where my anti-war politics come in. It's still a tragedy for the ordinary people in those regions who just want to fucking live their lives. And if we actually encourage Ukraine to take the deal, the peace deal, this would not have fucking happened. This would not have fucking happened. Right. Right. Simple. Which we right? said from day one. Which we said from day one. And like I said, I didn't even know anything about this. And I said right. that from day one. So how could I have called it right not knowing anything about it? Right? When you got Tony Blinken there leading us here. Victoria Newland leading us here. Right? Scott George says, video of Ukraine is out there, Russ. It's really bad there. Whole town's gone. They were afraid to show it. You know, we should search for some just to see. We, we, we should. Yeah. Out. Yeah. Because the Gaza stuff comes right to you because there's so much of it. Well, see, that's what I'm saying. It just it, it, it was never the case with Ukraine that it, you just see it on your feed. Exactly. Exactly. Um, all right. Uh, thank you, Jake, for reminding me to shout out our Patreon supporters. You can go to Patreon.com. I was wondering about Yeah, that. I almost fucked that up tonight. Uh, Patreon.com front slash do dissidents where you can become a member. Look at this. Jake redid the scroll. There's now four columns here on our patreon scroll looking very polished looking very clean for tonight thank you jake round of applause for jake um our patreon members our paid Substack subscribers and our paid locals members uh are the backbone of this show it is because of you guys that we are doing a show tomorrow so we said once we cross the 500 supporter threshold we're going to be adding a fourth show a week we are doing a show tomorrow as a Rumble exclusive with our friend Anish Shivani at 2 p.m. We got a bunch of great stuff that we're going to be covering there, uncensored and uncut, 2 p.m., exclusively on Rumble. So if you're not subscribed to our Rumble channel, you got to subscribe. You got to hit follow over there. If you can join and become a paid member, Locals is available right under the Rumble screen. So there's 1,400 of you beautiful people over on Rumble right now. You can join our locals community for as little as five bucks a month and support this show. You get your name up in lights on the credits. You get call in access to our post show Q and A's every Sunday evening, and you get access to two supporter exclusive live streams per month. Those perks are the same across the board, starting at just five bucks a month. And you get the good karma of supporting independent media. That's locals, Substack, and patreon.com front slash do dissidents if you can sign up it really helps us out it helps us add projects add streams add shows and uh like i said we try our best to make it worth your while with those member perks tusker thank you for the five dollars appreciate it so glad toria <laughs> can make a quiet smooth transition to weapons manufacturing this was a disgrace for her it was a reward for corporate service indeed toria you can't make it up toria tori surprised you didn't call her tori you know call yeah her who the fuck call, what kind of nickname is toria right like yeah. Tor, toria if you're gonna if you're gonna use a diminutive with a victoria it's tori tori or vicky right. or vicky right. that's it one or the other toria exactly. what the fuck is that yeah um Roy the Goy, Landrew has helped you avoid my crippling sanctions with his generous largesse. In response, I admit defeat. Perhaps I'll join your locals to make amends for my passive-aggressive tantrum. Yeah, did we step on your rumble ramp by accident? It was an accident. If we did it, it was an accident. You, you, you Roy cannot the defy the will of Landrew. We apologize. Yeah, it will not happen. It will not happen again. AJMQ, 
Thanks for the dollar. I think once you're in politics, win or lose, you'll always have a target on your back the rest of your life. It's dangerous, a blood sport, and would directly, indirectly have blood on your hands. It is a blood sport, no doubt about that. I mean, I mean, come on, man. There have been, I, I mean, with the politicians, I don't know, it's an open question. But we all know there have been reporters and investigators who officially committed suicide. Oh, of did course, not. yeah. I mean, do you, you remember that guy uh, during 2016, actually, he was doing some research into Hillary, and this guy specifically said that if anything happened to him, it was not suicide or something. And it was, yeah, you're was, talking about, uh, I forget his name. I think it was Victor it, Thorne. Was that the guy? Yeah, something like that. Um, yeah. And no, it, look, it was just saying. so obviously yeah. not a suicide. Uh, long story short, Russ, what's the name of the Jewish deli in the knowledge? Uh, uh, it's called Stein's. And, uh, you know, I should try something beyond the bagel while I'm here. The bagel was pretty good. The bagel was pretty good. So I, I, I will say this in New Orleans, you can get a bagel. The pizza is a fucking war crime, but the bagels are all right. Uh, all right, let's do uh, this next segment here. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was out and about in Brooklyn last night seeing a movie. We don't know which uh, movie she was seeing, but uh, we do Dune, know. Dune, probably. Yeah, probably Dune. That's, that, that's the big one out there now, right? But uh, here's Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez on the way out of the movie theater uh, getting some attention from some protesters who were trying to get her, love. yeah, yeah, to, trying to get her to uh, describe uh, what's happening in Gaza right now accurately as a genocide. Let's take a look. You refuse to call it a genocide. Oh, I, I need you to understand. It's not a genocide. It's not okay that there's a genocide happening. You're not actively against it. You're lying. I'm lying. You went on TV and avoided talking about it. The spice will flow. Yeah. Should have subtitled this. We can't call it a We're not lying. We're not lying. You've been sending in interviews. It's insane. You haven't been calling it a genocide. Don't tell me I'm lying. Then just say it's a genocide. Just say it. Over 30,000 people are dead, are dead, AOC. You can't just say it for once. Just say a word. That's it. That's all we want you to say. And she was really so in a pissy mood, too. Well, the movie ended on a cliffhanger. Oh, yeah. yeah that's probably why. It's like, I gotta wait another three years. <laughs> We're not doing anything. I'm not reading those fucking dorky books. Yeah. Just cut it, and you're going to cut this, and you're going to clip this. So that it's completely out of context. I already said that it was. And y'all are just going to pretend that it wasn't over and over again. It's fucked up, man. And you're, you're not helping these people. TV. And you're not helping them. You refuse to. You're not helping them. <laughs> They're helping them more than you are right now. Look, here's is, how is you that know. The fiance? Is that the fiancé? Is that the fiancé? So, yeah. That's him? I, I hope so. I hope so, or else she's got a couple. Of, she has she has another reason to be uh, upset that this video got out. No, that that's him. Um, no, uh, <laughs> the look. Um, you could tell she's lying. A, I mean, if you're tuned into this show, you know she has not called it a genocide. All yet. she had that to do was turn around, and say it's a genocide. Yes, exactly. Done. If Done. if they're lying, that right. means you've already called it a genocide once, which means. You can call it a genocide again, and they put their phones right. away, and they leave you alone. So right. that's how you that's know it. she's full of shit. If she weren't right. lying, she'd just say, yeah, I already said it was a genocide. You notice she didn't use the word there. She says, I already said it was. She stopped short. She said, I, didn't, I already said it was a genocide. She didn't want to say that because she didn't. If she had already said it, she'd have said it again, and they'd have left her alone, and that would have been the end of it. And that's, that's the length she'll go to to not say that word now you ask well she's for a ceasefire you know what are you giving her a hard time you're giving her a hard time because we often ask ourselves what we would do if we were alive during slavery if we were alive right. during the holocaust yep. what would we yep. do if we were around at a moment where such a large-scale obscenity a crime against humanity was taking place well this is that moment this right. is that moment right. and i'm sorry like Good isn't good enough when it comes to your 
re- like rhetoric even like it, like right. if if you if you understand what's going on you have an imperative to actually put it in as many words and you know that's why like guys like dean phillips get frustrated because he says well i criticize netanyahu right he just wants to scapegoat netanyahu put the entire right. you know they uh, all they uh, all want premise to do that. of the israeli project uh they all want to on do netanyahu's that. back is israel there was nothing wrong with israel until netanyahu who exactly. was hang on i thought this was an oasis of democracy in the middle east well so he was elected right so who elected him israelis right so clearly there was a problem there or he wouldn't have gotten elected. Well, right. Well, he's been a he's been a prominent figure within Israel since since the eighties, right? No, Except no. The, 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 the articles we're gonna we're gonna go over tomorrow with Anise, the uh, uh you know, anti Zionism is, is anti Semitism articles. Um, both of them get into uh, oh well Netanyahu most most Jews don't like him. Well, they fucking elected him and they keep electing him. So clearly they like him. Yeah, most uh, yeah. Somebody exactly. likes them. Well, of course. Well, you say the most Jews, most is Israelis, obviously. Israel. The ones who vote no, 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 because yeah. those are those articles are getting into American Jews. That's no, but why I'm saying they're the ones who they're elected. Zionists. They elected but, them. right? But yeah, right. Um, but you know, look, like a guy like Dean Phillips will say, "Well, I criticize Netanyahu. I think what's going on is horrible. So why don't you just leave me alone? Why do you push me further?" And that's where he gets upset, right? When people push him further, it's like, "Well, no. If you demonstrate a level of understanding about this, then of course you're going to be pushed further, because most right. people in politics don't demonstrate any understanding of this whatsoever. It's just scripted." Are you going to go propaganda. bother Amy Klobuchar? Right. 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 Exactly. What are we going to go bother her at the movies? You know, we don't expect her to get anything remotely close to right. If you're running as a progressive, if you are representing your district as a progressive and you have spoken out against what's happening to a degree, well, to a degree is not strong enough when we know that you know the truth is more severe than that. Same for Bernie Sanders, right? Uh, Same for Ilhan Omar. Same for all of these people. Like... Of course, you should push them to get them on record going as far as they should, because we are right. like we're all doing that. If you're if you're if you're saying you represent us and people like us, then, yeah, we're going to push you to be I'm, as good as you I, have to be I am on this sorry, issue. Man. That's that. the, this is why I say, what do they threaten these people with? Like what? Like why? Well, you know, she believes it's a genocide. I don't think that's a question whether she believes that or not. So what the fuck do they have over you that you won't just say that? She's an influencer. She's a celebrity. She's getting paid six figures for life. I mean, that's it. I mean, that's, that's not going to change from her turn around saying genocide. Yeah, that's but not it it puts you it puts you out of favor with people who. You I mean, is that is cross? that the extent of it? Uh, they're going to be mean to you in the lunchroom. Like, really? I mean, that's, I just can't believe it's that simple. Well, she says reputational relational harm. I mean, that's what they're saying. That's what matters to these people at a certain echelon of society. That's very important. Um, all right, let's go to some super chats uh, before we wrap the show. Caleb Tetro, thanks for the nine ninety nine. There's a hit piece video of George Galloway on the show Big Brother where he pretends to be a cat drinking cream from someone's hands. Tremendous. Made me like him even more. Interesting. That is funny. That's an interesting yeah. video. Uh, Derek, thanks for the five bucks. Ukraine war footage is mostly on various Telegram channels. Oh, okay. Interesting. Uh, Brent Yoendo. Sorry, boys. You're dead wrong. If anyone were the Mossad blackmail list, it's Trump. It would get worse. The only plus side is it would actually be pushed back from left with Trump. Yeah, I just don't agree. It could be really worse. I mean, worse in terms of like what the emotional processing is. You know, like, yeah, with Trump, he would say, well, they have to finish the problem, right? Right. Fuck them. With Biden, it's, well, we really hope they're careful. They're not careful. What are we going to do about it? Nothing. A a lot of people are saying the Arab countries should take them in. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's what you would get with Trump. Uh, 72, March Flower 15, Israel won't let resources in because they intend on kicking the Gazans out. Yep. Because why bring resources into a place you don't want them, evil Israel. Yeah, that thank is what you. what I've been saying for a while. This is this is their end game to make Gaza unlivable, 
so that there's pressure on the international community to put pressure on the Arab countries to take them in. And then once they're in, they'll never let them back. Right. Uh, yes, that is obviously uh, the end game. No doubt about that. That's very evident. Um, Scott George, Ukraine vids, Patrick Lancaster, and Military Summary Channel. Thank you, Scott George. Appreciate that. Uh, Tusker, I could die today if AOC was to point her bony hypocritical finger in my face. Ryan Grimm, <laughs> probably. <laughs> yes. Uh, Jody Hovel, virtual cookies for all in honor of Toria. Uh, all right. Uh, we're going to do one more segment, right, Russell? You, you got one. Oh, yeah, right. Uh, all right, folks, uh, we got one more segment that we want to do. This is a sad one, but it's kind of uplifting at the same time. Uh, this is, uh, quite, the this story. is the feel good story of the yes. show. Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. All right. So. so, uh, California prisoner donates earnings from 13 cent hourly wage to Gaza. And let me just pause right there. This is an issue, the fact that we've recreated slavery in the prison system that I am very passionate about, and we have not gotten to cover it as much as I would like. There is actually going to be an event here in New Orleans that I'm going to attend, um, drawing attention to the slave labor conditions in Louisiana prisons. So that's not the focus of this story, but just to point out um, he, he had a 1774 paycheck for 136 and a half hours of work. All right. $17 and, you, and 74 cents. And you have, listen, this is not just, oh, you're down working on the chain gang or on the pea farm. This is, you have these major brands that get their shit done by prison labor. It is truly a recreation of the slave system particularly given who the majority of the prison population is. Um, so moving along, side note, uh, donors have raised more than $100,000 for an incarcerated man in the U.S. who, earning 13 cents an hour in a California prison doing janitorial and porter work, donated his paycheck of 1774 to Gaza relief efforts. Last month, the Los Angeles-based filmmaker Justin Mashoff, who has been in correspondence with the 56-year-old man, known only by the name Hamza, shared photos on social media of Hamza's October time log and a check of 1774 with the words, California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. The time log indicated 21 days' worth of work totaling 136 and a half hours. Uh, so this is the tweet. Uh, an incarcerated brother I am in correspondence with donated 1774 for relief efforts in Gaza. This donation is the sum of 136 hours of his labor in the prison working as a porter janitor. May his sincere donation be multiplied by the creator. Hashtag Gaza, hashtag ceasefire now. And uh, there's his timesheet with the check. Um, Mashoff's post of Hamza's donation immediately went viral with more than 24,000 likes and over 8,200 tweets. On Instagram, the grassroots organization Palestinian Youth Movement shared Hamza's story, writing, Some of the deepest solidarity with Palestine in the U.S. lies in the prison system, not only today, but historically. The incarceration system in the U.S. and in occupied Palestine are ultimately extensions of the same imperial project, one that seeks to criminalize the existence of the oppressed, to render them invisible, and to neutralize them as a threat to the dominant social order. Yes, exactly, exactly. According to legal records reviewed by the Washington Post, Hamza was convicted, see, this is horrible too. He was convicted to one count of second degree murder in 1986 and was sentenced to 15 years to life. At the time of his guilty plea, Hamza was still a teenager. In a GoFundMe campaign page, Mashaf established for Hamza, Mashaf wrote, in the 80s, Hamza accidentally fired a gun at a loved one, which killed the victim, 
leading to his imprisonment for over four decades. He has lived with the pain of losing his family member due to his own mistake every day for decades. While in prison, he has become a devout Muslim and has been pleading for parole for decades. In a statement on the campaign page, Mashaf wrote that Hamza is scheduled to be freed at the end of March. Since its creation, the campaign has raised $102,187 for Hamza's re-entry journey. The funds will be used for rent and utilities, clothing, job search and training, as well as cell phone services, according to the campaign. In a statement posted to X by Moshaf on Wednesday, Hamza announced his decision to suspend the campaign. From my heart, I thank you all for your generosity and kindness in donating these funds to help and assist me upon my release from prison, Hamza wrote. However, I must ask each of you now to please look upon and consider the suffering children, mothers and fathers of Palestine, Yemen, and Africa living under inhumane conditions, being bombed every hour of the day without water, shelter, medication, and food, who are ordinary people and citizens, just like all of you living their lives, having not a thing to do with the politicians, but are suffering inhumanely, he added. Now understand, this is a guy who, based on that story, should probably never have been in prison in the first place. And even if this was with intent, he was a teenager at the time, and he's been in prison for 40 years. And he has all of these people donating in this campaign for his re-entry into society. And he tells people to stop giving money to him and to think about the people in Palestine. That is just an incredible, remarkable human being. And, um, yeah. you know, I hope, I hope he's able to live the rest of his life with dignity and happiness when he gets out. That that's just, it's a horrible story on the level of his incarceration, but, uh, it's a really uplifting story too, that there are people who in the face of what was done to him and what horrors he must've experienced in that prison to find such deep compassion for the suffering of the Palestinians. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Second, all of that. And you know, this is why I, I say over and over again, whenever this topic comes up, how out of control sentencing is here in this country. Like, he was a teenager. It's just sick. It's medieval. He made a horrible it's mistake. Medieval. Now, you want to say that because he was reckless and someone paid with their life for his recklessness, there should be some penalty for that? Sure. 40 years for that when he was a right. minor at the time? Right. At 40 years right. for that? It was an accident, obviously, is what that article says. It was an accident. It was a reckless accident. You want to say there's a price to be paid for that? Okay. 40 fucking years for that? Right? I mean, that's just horrible. This is why when the January 6 people started getting these sentences handed down, you know, saw seeing all these liberals, all these you know, red compassionate people. He should go to jail for 20 years. What the fuck are you talking about? Like, right. what are you talking right. about? You're talking about locking someone in a cage away from the family, away from society for, you know, in this case, more than half of the guy's life. You only get one life. This guy spent right. more than half of it in a cage for an accident that happened when he was a teenager. Right. It's just sick. It's just absolutely sick. And this was this is why when you hear ideas like prison abolition, it's very easy to dismiss those as silly and unserious and unserious. And I don't think they're I don't think they're unserious at all. I think they require a broader transformation of society in order to get to a place where you can imagine a world without prison. But we should talk about a world without prison. We should talk about a world beyond prison, right? Because that is a very serious idea, I think. And I think it's a great idea. Now, you want to start having those conversations in context of capitalism under neoliberalism. Well, those are non-starters in these current circumstances. But it's important to talk about those kinds of things because even if you don't think that that is an attainable reality, what an argument like prison abolition opens your eyes to is just how radical the current actual right. status quo is right. this is radical this is unserious this is insane that a teenager fires a gun by accident and pays with his life for it 
right? 40 years. How radical is that? 40 years. How insane is that? How unserious, how silly is that? We don't make fun of people for advocating for that system. Well, that's the system we have. That's the system we have. Is that less uh, ridiculous than saying no jails at all? No, I don't think it's less ridiculous. I think it's more ridiculous because I think it's actually more harmful. Well, I, I believe it was in, uh, and this came up in the last show, uh, Michael Moore, um, Where Should We Invade Next, uh, where they showed how, I, I think it was in Scandinavia, um, they have a prison system where basically you live in a house. Yeah, you live in with, a little with, apartment, with, a nice like, little apartment. With like housemates, and you do chores together, and you... you and you have a kitchen where you cook. That was a really funny scene. There's a funny scene where this guy is cooking and he's got these knives, these really sharp, big knives that he's cooking with. And Michael Moore asks him, what are you in for? Murder. Yeah. <laughs> and they give you a fucking kitchen with all these knives that you're cooking and Michael's oh, in the room with him and he's oh, cooking oh, dinner with these oh, huge fucking right. knives that you can fucking gut a, gut a rhinoceros with. What are you in for? Murder. Mur but but here's here's the question. If your intention is actually rehabilitation, how do you think you're going to rehabilitate people treating them like animals course, and right. subjecting them to horrific psychological and emotional trauma and isolation? How, how are they going to rejoin society? How are you rehabilitating people? Like, obviously, an approach like that, if your intention is actually to rehabilitate Clearly, that would be the approach you would want to take. It's not about rehabilitation. It's barbaric. It's medieval. It's about torturing these people psychologically. It's about revenge. It's, yes, about, it's about making society feel biblical. that they are are you know getting their justice against the evildoers. Yeah. And uh, all it does is make stuff. these people even worse when they get out. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Well. This guy is certainly better on the way out, and uh, yeah, best of luck to him. He's, that is, he's a he's a rare case. I mean, you know, the recidivism rates are something like eighty oh, percent, I think. Yeah, no, that so that is a a sad story for sure, but an uplifting one uh, ultimately. Uh, Miriam Adelson is both Trump and Netanyahu's prime donor. Any confrontation would be pure theater. Thank you. Warren pickles three two one thanks for the five bucks re, R E Joe my vote's not lost you can do any one of three things apply the Russian sanctions to Israel grab the Israeli government send them to the Hague plus turn himself in okay well you would vote for him if he turns himself into the Hague or pull a JC and raise thirty thousand Palestinians from the grave have you ever seen the towering inferno I watched it last night fantastic movie wow man i like i probably saw that the last time literally when i was like a little kid when it was like when they were making yeah, well, was, all those all those disaster that was movies. your era yeah that was, when uh, i was a child sense. all those disaster movies were coming out the towering inferno the poseidon adventure earthquake yeah uh yeah earthquake that was another one Kuznetsky Bassain, thanks for the four ninety nine. Cheers, fight fascism. JM, thanks for the two dollars. Appreciate that. FU, thanks for the ten dollars. Appreciate that. Kenman, Michael Moore lies a lot in his films. Uh, you know, look, he is an opinion editor. I don't know of any like outright lies. I mean, I don't know, um, but those are editorials. You know, I don't know of anything like untrue uh, in one of his movies. Uh, Jan Clements, as long as we have a prison system like this, none of us are free. By the way, L.A. is the state with the highest incarceration rates. Oh, I'm sorry. Louisiana is the state with the highest incarceration rates. Sorry. Yeah, that does that does not uh, that does not surprise me at all. Look, living living in America, uh, you're, you're you're never more than one bad twist of fate from being the protagonist in an Alfred Hitchcock movie. Right. Yeah, that's true. You know, um, you're, you're, you're going to be the wrongly accused man trying to escape the forces of uh, of society. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, all right. Well, that is our show for the evening, I think, right? Earthquake in Sin Surround. There was a earthquake Yeah, they ride. did that in Sin Surround. Somebody also mentioned, um, yeah, that was one of those. They, these movies, Irwin Allen was the producer was known for them. Uh, airport, airport, uh, 77 
was guy. another one of these. So it was basically, you know, the plane. And right, right. Down and I remember that. there was an earthquake ride at Universal Studios until fairly recently. I don't think it's there Oh, anymore. was there? Oh, um, right, right. Yeah, yeah. All right, folks, we will see you all tomorrow at 2 p.m. on Rumble. Make sure you go to rumble.com front slash do dissidents and hit that follow button tomorrow, uh, 2 p.m., a uh, show exclusive to Rumble. Uh, we will be there with our friend Anish Shivani, and then we'll be back here on Thursday morning. Thank you all very much for being here tonight. Thank you, Jake, in the booth for helping us out. Big round of applause for Jake. Thank you all Woo! very much for being here. We will see you all again tomorrow afternoon, 2 p.m. Eastern over on Rumble. Make sure oh, you crap. sign up to our Substack, our newsletter. That is very important, dudissidents.substack.com. Thank you all very much. That is where you will get info as to where and when we will be broadcasting. So the next show is tomorrow at 2 as a Rumble exclusive. Thank you all very much for being here tonight. Until we see you again. Be safe and be well. Courage. Please clap.